Good morning, everyone, and welcome. We'll get started here. Great to see you all this morning for our second lecture in our series on world religions. Uh, some of you I know were at our, this may, if you didn't make it last week, I know some of you were at our previous series of lectures that we had over in our old building. Um, but we're just starting up. This will be a recurring series uh, on different topics, but we're calling it the eight-week lecture series. And, as you can see, especially if you were here last week, our topic is going to be world religions. And again, for those of you who weren't here last week, some people have said, well, why? Obviously, we're in a Christian church, and I'm the minister of this church. Why are we talking about world religions? Well, partly because that's been some of my disciplinary background in terms of studies that I've done, but also because while I am a Christian, I come from a Christian worldview, I think it's very important for me, and in fact for you, whatever worldview you come from, in order to be able to sensibly and reasonably articulate what it is you believe, or maybe even to decide what it is you believe, I think we have to have a broader understanding than many of us do about what are the faith traditions of the world. And so, if anything, being a Christian minister in a Christian church, I talk about world religions because we need to decide what we believe, but we also, in the context of that, need to decide what is it we don't believe. Because religions are very different. Uh, they are not all the same, even though that's a very common perception these days, that all religions are basically just, uh, just variations of the same themes. They are quite different, and so we'll get into that. Today, we are going to be talking about Hinduism. Um, our, as our second lecture, and we're going to, last week we did an introduction, that introduction will be on the internet, on our LIT website, I'll give you that website a little bit later on, the, so you can get the introduction to uh, world religions, which I call the universal human experience, the fact that we have never known any culture anywhere at any time that has not had some kind of religious belief, some sort of belief in the supernatural or supernatural beings or something beyond the material world. Today we're going to be talking about Hinduism, which we're doing these in chronological order, Hinduism being the oldest of the extant, meaning still existing, world religions. And next week we will be looking at Judaism, then the religions of India. Now, properly, Hinduism is a religion of India, and I could have included it, but because it's the oldest, and to be frank, the most complicated of all the world religions, and you'll learn that very soon, um, then I, we needed to talk about it by itself. The religions of India, besides Hinduism, include Buddhism, Sikhism, Jainism, uh, all of them having come out of Hinduism originally. Then on September 18th, the religions of China and Japan, what is usually called the Far Eastern or Far East Asian religions, but as I say, Far Eastern could be anything beyond Satman de Bobotlan for us. So we're, I call that the religions of China and Japan. Then on the 25th, we will talk about Christianity. Um, on the 2nd of October, Islam, which I have lectured on before. That was in the last series. Uh, always the one people are very interested in because what's in the news these days more than Islam. And then on October 9th, we'll sort of do a, a clean sweep, kind of a mashup. We'll talk about some about animism, New Age, atheism, especially the New Atheism and Secularism, and I'll sort of do some concluding remarks as well. So that's where we're going in this, um, and we will jump into that. As we talked last week, there are a lot of different definitions for what religion actually is. Generally speaking, most people would think, and a basic dictionary definition is belief in or worship of gods or God. Uh, belief in supernatural beings is one of the frequent definitions. Some people would identify religion as service or worship of God or the supernatural, but there actually are a number of religions that don't advocate, world religions, that don't advocate belief in God. In fact, when we talk about Hinduism, you will be surprised to find out there are many different ways you can look at Hinduism. One of them is that it is atheistic. It doesn't actually believe in God or, a, or gods. That's very complicated, but we're going to get into that. That's why we're here today. So, a good definition, I think, from the Global Philosophy of Religion by Joseph Unzo says, Genuine religion is fundamentally a search for meaning beyond materialism, that means the physical world. A world religion tradition is a set of symbols and rituals, myths and stories, concepts and truth claims, which a historical community believes gives ultimate meaning to life via its connection to a transcendent beyond the natural order. Transcendent means something other than us, apart from us, beyond the natural order. So that, I think, in terms of talking about world religions, is a good definition. We're looking, I think we can conceive of religion as being of three types. World religion, which 
what we're talking about are those extant, still existing, that word extant is a good one, an important one, those extant faiths which are historically transcultural and international, not limited to one locale. Secondly, indigenous religions are smaller, culturally specific or nation specific religious groups that are in isolated areas, are not worldwide or international. And then new religious movements are those faiths that are recently developed. When we get to the end of our, our series, the le eighth lecture, I'll talk about animism, which in terms of a religious belief or motivation is perhaps the oldest of all. But then I'll also talk about New Age, New Atheism, and Secularism, which are the modern religious movements. And people may say atheism is a religious movement. Absolutely. Uh, we'll talk about that. In terms of religions by size, the largest religion in the world is still Christianity at about 2.2 billion people. That's about 29.5% of all the population of the world. Then second is Islam, which is at 1.6 billion. And I'm sure you've heard or read, Islam is the fastest growing religion in the world, but a lot of people don't know. It's not the fastest growing because of conversion. Actually, Islam has almost a flat conversion rate, but it's the fastest growing because of birth rate. The countries where Islam is the dominant, or in some cases almost entirely, the religious scene, those are countries that have some of the highest birth rates. Um, in fact, uh, I, the talks I did in the last series, I talked about the conflict, why they can't find peace in Israel. One of the reasons they can't find peace in Israel is that the, the Jewish nation of Israel cannot give the vote, or you know, one man, one vote, one person, one vote, to the Muslim Palestinians because they outnumber them and their birth rate is growing much faster. That differentiation is growing even, you know, the, the difference is growing even faster. And the nation of Israel, which was founded as a nation to give the Jewish people uh, refuge, they feel if they give equality of vote to the, the Muslim Palestinians who are already bigger and growing faster, then eventually they'll be voted out of existence as a Jewish nation. That's one of the reasons there's a problem. So Islam is growing fastest, but it's primarily because of birth rate. Then Hinduism at about 1.1 billion. Now these numbers, you'll notice that they're they're very general and they're not exact. Hinduism, if you study it, you'll get people saying anything from 800 um, 800,000 to 2.2 billion, double this number, depending on who you ask. But this is a widely accepted number. And then Buddhism, the Chinese traditional religions, etc. We'll get into some more of those later. I showed you this map last week. Briefly, it is a distribution of world religions today, the major, and in each case the color represents the dominant religions. Um, and we will be talking today about this area, the green, which is India, Nepal, um, and Bhutan are the areas where Hinduism is the dominant religion. Okay, a lot of people think of Buddhism in Nepal, but still Hinduism is the dominant religion here. So this part of South Asia, is where we are talking about today. In terms of date of founding, I've already mentioned Hinduism is the oldest world religion. It was founded somewhere between 4,000 and 2,500 BC, so we're talking 6,000 to 4,500 years ago. Um, some people would advocate or would say that the basis of Hindu religion may be as much as, uh, as 100,000 BC, that the oral traditions that led to modern Islam, now that's way before writing began. Writing began sometime in the 4th millennium BC. But, so they didn't have written text, but it's believed the oral traditions may have started that early. Judaism is the second oldest of the world religions, followed by Buddhism, the Chinese traditional re religions, Shinto, which is the national religion of Japan, and on down that list. Christianity coming right about the middle, you know, right about 30 AD by our accounting. By the way, I also mentioned, if you read any kind of scholarly or even sort of just general documents these days, you will see that it's, it's changing from the old designation of B.C. and A.D., B.C. before Christ, A.D. Anno Domini, because in the West we, ch we changed our calendar um, at the time of Jesus. Today they tend to use B.C.E., which means before the Common Era, because out of respect for the fact there are many people who are Christian, and so why have that be that? But the whole world has gone that way, so they came up with a different label. So it will be BCE, and then instead of AD, which would be Anno Domini, the year of our Lord, they will use CE, or Common Year. So before Common Year and Common Year. I don't do that, because there's enough stuff that's confusing anyway. 
and people are used to seeing BC and AD, so that's what you will see me using, all right? Now, one thing I will point out, and we'll get into this a little bit later, uh, not today, but later on in the lecture series, you will notice that from Buddhism, Chinese traditional religion, Shinto and Jainism, all of those religions, and Chinese tradition includes Confucianism, Taoism, some Chinese shamanism, etc. All of those world religions began within about 100 years of each other. It's an extraordinary anthropological phenomenon. This, era, this time is called the Axial Age. And we'll get into that a little bit when we get to Buddhism. But this time is when religious motivation or spirit, whatever you would say, seemed to be really exploding in the world, especially in Asia, because all of these are Asian religions, as are most. The monotheistic religions come from the Middle East. The Asian religions are most of the others that we'll be talking about. Okay, that's all by way of preface. Let's get into our actual discussion of Hinduism. Hinduism is not called Hinduism by those who practice it generally. It's, it goes by one of two names. It's either called, and this is, these are translations of ancient Sanskrit words. Uh, Sanskrit was the ancient language of India, and India, by the way, when we talk about Hinduism began in India, in fact, it's considered the manifestation of Indian culture. In, the, in those days, India included modern-day Pakistan. Pakistan was formed uh, in the middle of the 20th century. It used to be part of India. Uh, but the Sanatana Dharma and Vaidika Dharma <coughs> mean, in Sanskrit, the eternal way, or law. And again, we have to be careful translating words into word from other languages to our language because they don't always mean the same thing. Uh, Vaidika Dharma means the way or law of the Vedas. Veda is, were the ancient writings, which again, some people believe, began in an oral tradition uh, as much as 100,000 years ago. But certainly, we know that there's evidence of them having been part of an oral tradition by about 6,000 years ago. Now, we know this as Hinduism. The word Hindu is not originally a Sanskrit word, Sanskrit being the ancient language of that part of the world. Hindi is the most popular language now, and most of the languages in India and those areas developed from the ancient language of Sanskrit. Now, um, just like most of the languages that we know today developed from Latin or Greek, you know, Greek is still spoken, Latin is not spoken anymore, but their Latin roots are almost all of our languages. The same thing is true of Sanskrit and some of the languages in this Indo-European uh, kind of language groups. But Hindu most likely comes from an ancient Persian name for the Indus River, river that runs through um, part of what we know of as Pakistan, part uh, now Western India. Um, the name in ancient Persian of that river was Shindu, or sometimes Hindu, and the region, therefore, the Persians conquered that area, the, the region was called Hindustan, the inhabitants of that region were called Hindus, and the religion they practiced, which they were practicing before the Persians or anybody else got there, was called Hinduism. Now, it is, as I've already said, the world's oldest extant religion. We believe it's, it, it started sometime 10,000 BC to 5,000 BC, but it is quite different as a religion because Hinduism has no single founder, it has no prophets, although it has teachers, gurus, swamis, uh, people who were monks who wrote down the Vedas by inspiration of Brahman, the great god, they believe. It has no single concept of deity. There is no central theological system, single uh, theological system, no single holy text, no single central religious authority. It is in many ways not fitting into any traditional definition of religion in terms of a creedal system of beliefs. You don't have to believe any particular things to claim you're a Hindu. In fact, Hinduism has variously, and still today, is variously perceived as being monotheistic, meaning one god, as polytheistic, meaning many gods, as henotheistic, meaning there are a lot of gods, but we pick one to worship, as pantheistic, meaning all things are part of God, as panentheistic, meaning all things are part of God and then God is more than that, Pandeistic, meaning God created the world, but then he sort of absorbed himself into the world that doesn't exist apart from the world anymore. Or even atheistic, that God does not exist. In some ways, it's almost unfortunate we start with Hinduism. I mean, it's... it's because it is very complicated. I mean, they have had 10 to 12,000 years, perhaps, to develop an accrual of various kinds of beliefs and various kinds of traditions. One of the concepts of Hinduism is what's called the Ishta Devaha, 
which means in, in Sanskrit, the chosen deity. The idea that everyone must find their own best way to get to the ultimate reality, which is called Brahman. I'll talk about that in a few minutes. And so therefore, traditionally, Hinduism has been extraordinarily tolerant. You can believe almost anything and be okay with most Hindus. Now there have been in recent history, particularly in the, in the, uh, the 1990s, there was a very nationalistic, very conservative Hindu government that came into power in India. And for a period of that government being in control, they became very pro-Hindu and very anti-anything else. And there was a lot of persecution of Christians, especially in India in that time. But that government has gone back out and they've returned to a very tolerant approach. But the reason that they're tolerant is because, again, there is, there's no single kind of thing that you can call Hinduism, really. They do have common philosophy, they do have some common expectations in terms of what the goals of life are, etc. But it is very different. It is a conglomeration of very different religious, philosophical, and cultural ideas. The one thing that they especially have in common is they all did originate in what was then India. Um, and some of those beliefs, some of the beliefs that do carry over from the various schools and things, we'll talk about the schools, are reincarnation, the absolute being, of Brahman, who is represented in multiple manifestations. They believe in the law of cause and effect, what we call karma, what we know of, what they call karma, what we know of as karma. They believe in following a path of righteousness and a desire for liberation from the cycle of births and deaths. That reincarnation is part of what everyone experiences, but the goal is to get out of that loop. And we'll talk about that. So, there have been and are thousands of different religious groups all of which have very different focus, but all of which consider themselves part of the Hindu faith. Now part of what happened is as various people down through the millennia have invaded India, they have influenced the development of the Hindu culture and religious beliefs. In particular, Hinduism tended before about 800 AD, so we're talking 1200 years ago. 800 AD is when Islam conquered all of that part of the world. Prior to Islam coming in and conquering this area, Hinduism was pretty clearly polytheistic, meaning they believed in many different gods. Well, Islam came in, and one of the, the, the fundamental principle of Islam is there is only one God. In fact, the, the statement of faith in Islam is there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. So the idea of having multiple gods did not go over very well with the Muslim you know, rulers. They actually gave considerable religious freedom, but they did influence the religion because starting in about the 800s, instead of being polytheistic, Hinduism began to change into more of a monotheistic view, but with the idea that the one God, or the one ultimate reality, they don't call him a God, they don't think he has, per has a personality in the way we think of a, of a God, that Brahman, the ultimate reality, the one that encompasses everything, he, was, he has been manifest, or incarnated, to use a more a term Christians are more used to, incarnated in various different deities that have come to earth. Those deities are called avatars. Avatar is not just a movie with blue people in it. <laughs> Avatar means a, a deity that has become, taken on flesh and come to earth on purpose. And so the idea became that um, after the influence of Islam in Hinduism, that Brahman is the one God. There is only one God, but he has been manifested or incarnated in various avatars. And that's sort of how they merge those two beliefs. Um, some, I think that it's not unfair at all to say that most Hindus are still what we would have to consider objectively from the outside as being polytheistic. Now, where do they get these beliefs? Um, Hinduism has a number of different religious texts, which they call Shastras. In fact, the first group, uh, there's, there's two main groups. I'm going to go ahead and put this up there. The two main groups are called Shruti, which means heard literature. It's heard because these, these were heard, remembered, and orally transmitted, and later written down by Hindu monks and hermits who lived in the forests. It is believed that it is heard because this was given by Brahman. It was given by the one ultimate reality to them. They didn't make this up. So they believe it is revealed in that regard. And there are two main parts to the Shruti. Shruti, the, the heard texts, are the most important. 
in terms of the faith. The first and most important and oldest of these are called the Vedas. The Vedas uh, were oral prior to 5000 BC. They were written down probably very early in the history of written literature at all. They are considered, with the possible exception of some of the Egyptian pyramid texts, they're considered some of the oldest religious writings in history. There are four major Vedas, the Rig Veda, Sama Veda, uh, Yajur Veda, and Atharva Veda, and each of them focuses on a different thing. The Rig Veda, which is most important and oldest of all, are hymns of praise and knowledge of the Divas. In addition to believing in gods, and again, this is so complicated, but I can't put everything on the slide at one time. Uh, in addition to major gods that they believe in, they also believe that there are celestial beings, sort of angelic beings, which are also gods, minor gods, that are called divas. You wonder where that word comes from? It comes from, it means a divine being. And so we call somebody a diva, that means, oh, they're just a divine singer or whatever. But the divas, it's believed there are 330 million plus of these smaller gods that exist and so the Rig Veda, the oldest, uh, is the hymns of praise and knowledge of the devas, the, the 330 million gods. The Sama Veda is wisdom for the priests to proclaim sacrificial chants. The Yajur Veda is knowledge of sacrificial rituals uh, for individuals. And the Atharva Veda is the knowledge of the incarnations of the deity the Brahman into uh, people. Now, the um, Atharaveda is not very popular because it's believed that it is a revelation about the gods that is so powerful that it is not to be read lightly. In fact, they say women have had miscarriages from reading this without taking proper precautions. So they believe there is real power in these. Those are the Shruti Vedas. The second kind of Shruti or heard literature is the Upanishads. The Upanishads are often referred to, they are uh, perhaps the most popular of the old ancient writings, the Shruti. They deal with the nature of ultimate reality, they're the foundation of all Hindu philosophical thought. And you'll sometimes, you know, when people are talking about ancient important documents, you'll hear them say, they're the Upanishads. I remember I saw a play once, a humorous play, in which Lily Tomlin was in it, and she said, oh, you're also reading the Upanishads, and but what's an Upanishad? <laughs> ancient Hindu document that expounds the philosophy of Hindu and the nature of ultimate reality. Then the second big kind of religious text, or big category, is the, the Shmariti, which are memorized or remembered poetry or epics. The word actually means memorized or remembered. They came much later, and they are not considered revealed in the same way as the Vedas, but they are more popular because they're easier to read. They're not as heavy. Uh, they are often memorized, which you given the, the title. One of them is called the Ramayana, which means Rama's journey. It is the most popular of all the epics. These are epic, epic poems, epic stories. It's the story of a royal couple, and it deals with their relationship and the relationships that give ideals about what, what an ideal father should be, an ideal servant, a brother, a wife, a king. And then you have the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata is the world's longest epic poem. It deals with the philosophy and devotion. It has to do with two families. It's sort of a, you know, a Hatfields and McCoys or a Romeo and Juliet. There are two major princely families that are fighting each other. And in the process of telling that story, it gets into all sorts of truths about uh, what's important, uh, what devotion, real devotion is. One part of, of that is the Bhagavad Gita which is the most pop popular of all of the writings of Hindi, Hinduism. It's, that is literally the song of the adorable one. It is about Prince Arjuna, and his chariot driver happens to be Krishna, which is an avatar, a manifestation of Vishnu, one of the great gods. And uh, Arjuna is getting ready to fight in this war with a, against another family. But he realizes he has relatives there, and he doesn't want to fight because he feels like he might end up killing or hurting someone that is that he has affiliation with or affection for. And Krishna convinces him that he has a responsibility to fulfill his destiny. And his destiny is to be a warrior, and eventually Arjuna accepts that. But in the process of that discussion, we find a lot out about selfless action. In fact, Mahatma Gandhi, the founders of the Indian, uh, and also the founders of the Indian nation and others, looked to the Bhagavad Gita for a lot of their inspiration about being selfless. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi, called this his spiritual diary, because it was from that that he learned the responsibility for selfless action, okay? 
There are other kinds of writings, the sutras, a collection of aphorisms of various kinds. You may have heard the term Kama Sutra. Sutra are sort of one-liners, a book of one-liners. But Kama is the, the seeking of sensual pleasure. The Kama Sutra is a sex manual, okay? Which is one of the reasons it's been very popular in the West. Right? The whole tantric sex thing. Uh, but you also have the Puranas, the Aranyakas, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail of those, but there are a lot of these documents. In fact, as I said, the, the Ramayana is in seven volumes, and it's not the longest of these. The Hindu writings have been accumulating over thousands and thousands of years, and they're huge. And there are sections of it that Hindus probably never read. There are other sections that are very popular amongst Hindu people. And so, but this is where they get their ideas, and they believe the Vedas especially were inspired by Brahma, the, you know, the ultimate reality, as what they needed to know in order to live their life correctly and well. Yes? If they're such huge volumes, and people don't have that much access to them, how do they know, how well, are they guided? So how are they guided, how do people get this if they're so big and not everybody has access to them? Because maybe these countries are very poor. Well, much of it is memorized, and much of it will be, they may not have copies in their homes, but there are Hindu temples, and the priests have it memorized, or they have copies available. One of the reasons why, you'll notice the Bhagavad Gita is part of the Mahabharata, and it's the sixth, the sixth book in it, the sixth chapter, and so it's a shorter version, but they focus on that, and so they don't deal with all of this stuff. There are certain sections of it that they focus on much more, okay? But all of it has been influential in the development of Hindu, the Hindu faith. Now, there are five principles of Hinduism. I'm going to give you five principles and four goals and ten disciplines and, you know, and a partridge and a pear tree. We'll get to that. The five basic principles are, one, God exists, but he does not exist in the form we would think of as a God. He is not a personal God. He is the one absolute Om. You guys have seen movies where somebody said they're going, Om. Oh. That sound is, is believed to be an expression of the one absolute reality who is, that is called Brahman. And in fact, they say that when you do the Aum, you can't do that forever. When it stops, Brahman inhabits that silence. Okay? Brahman is manifest in many different forms. He especially is manifest in a trinity of Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. I'm going to talk about the gods in a minute and tell you that. That's, that's the trinity, if you will. Those are the three primary ways that Brahman ultimate reality is manifest. Brahma, the, it, don't confuse Brahman, the big reality, with Brahma, one of his manifestations. Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. Secondly, they believe that all human beings are divine. When you hear people say, well, you know, get in touch with the God that is in you. That goes back to Hinduism, ultimately. New Ageism, well, the New Age movement, and much of it is a reflection of ancient Hindu ideas that have sort of been revamped, polished, and simplified. Um, and cheapify. But the reason why all human beings are divine is because we are all part of the ultimate reality. We are all part of Brahman, according to Hinduism. Uh, there's also a belief in the unity of all existence through love, and that includes various disciplines um, like nonviolence and generosity and various things of that sort. Uh, there is religious harmony. I mentioned to you earlier the idea that everyone must find their own path to this ultimate reality. And so there has historically been a very generous attitude. And then there is the knowledge of the three Gs. They are Ganga, or Ganja, which I don't, I'm reluctant to call it Ganja, although it can be pronounced several ways. Ganja people think, you, you know, you're Rastafarian. But Ganga, the sacred river, the river, uh, which is the Ganges River, as we call it, is considered a goddess. It is the embodiment of all sacred waters. And so Hindus will regularly, if they can, if they're close enough, or at least once, will go and dip themselves in the Ganges River. Um, there is Gita, which is the sacred scripture. Bhagavad Gita. Gita means sacred writing. And then there's the uh, Gayatri, which is a sacred mantra, a song or a hymn. Um, mantra can mean uh, a chant, a prayer, usually a prayer. Um, but especially when they talk about the Gayatri, they mean the Gayatri uh, mantra, which addresses the sun god, uh, Surya. Um, among other things, the Hindus worship the celestial bodies, the planets, the sun, the moon, etc. Um, pretty much anything falls in there if you've got 330 million gods. So let's talk about the Hindu concept of deity. 
first bra is the one, the supreme absolute, the unity of all reality. Again, a Hindu would say, that's not God the way you understand it to be. It is not a personal God. He's not somebody you can, you know, you can relate to as directly as you all think. They do not see Brahman that way. In fact, I think the best description for the, the history of Hinduism is that it is a panentheistic religion. Panentheism means everything is part of God, and then God is something plus something. Okay? The Native American religions are that when they talk about the spirit of the mountain, the spirit of the rivers, etc., but then they have the great spirit, which is above even that, but all of it is part of him. I think that's the best way to understand uh, Hinduism, that Brahman is the sum of everything and then a little more. Now, Brahman is manifest, or incarnated, or has avatars that of various kinds, particularly the Trimurti. The Trimurti is the Hindu version of a trinity. Now, these are not individual, uh, depending on who yet, they're, they're seen as being manifestations of various kinds of Brahman. There is Brahma, the creator. Now, you'd think that he was the big guy, but he's not. Of the major deities, he's the least. Um, in fact, he's considered to live on a lotus flower that is in the navel of Vishnu, who's the second one. Brahma is the creator, Vishnu is the preserver, and she is manifest in a number of avatars, the two most popular ones you may have heard of, Krishna and Rama. Do we have any George Harrison fans here? Remember the song, My Sweet Lord? In that period of time, George Harrison was following the Krishna consciousness, the Ishkat movement. And so, it, in the song, if you listen to it, it says, Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna. This is one of the manifestations or avatars of Vishnu, the protector or preserver god. Um, there then is the third, is Shiva, the destroyer, but in destroyer, that sounds awfully negative, but a lot of people are really keen on Shiva because he's also the remaker. He destroys and then rebuilds, he reconstitutes. And so he's seen as accurately reflecting the nature of human life. You know, things get broken down and then they get put back together. Now, um, in addition, again, there are 330 million of these, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the whole list. <laughs> But of the other major gods that you will see mentioned, there is Shakti, also called Devi, who is the Divine Mother. There is Ganesha, who is one of the most popular of all the Hindu uh, gods. And you will recognize Ganesha because, anybody know? He has the head of an elephant. Okay. Um, which must have thrilled his mother. But, um, da -da -da, come on. Um, Ganesha is the patron of writing, of arts and sciences, and he's, because he's got the head of an elephant, he's known as the remover of barriers. Uh, then you've got Surya, which is the chief solar deity, the god of the sun, and again, they worship the planets uh, as, as these divas as well. Now, you will notice that I have highlighted on here um, Vaishnavism, Shivaism, Shaktiism, and Smartism. There are four major denominations, if you will, or schools within Hinduism. And they variously will focus on, Vaishnavism focuses on the worship of Vishnu. That's there, and they in fact consider Vishnu to be the supreme god, <coughs> contrary to what other Hindus believe. Uh, those who, who recognize Shiva as being foremost uh, practice what's called Shivaism. Those who uh, look to the Divine Mother Shakti worship uh, according to the school of Shaktism. And then those who look at a multiple of gods, especially five gods, which include Ganesha, uh, and Shura uh, practice what's called smartism, or smart mind. So there are various kinds of uh, denominations, is not a bad way to think of that, within Islam based upon which of the gods they choose to focus on. Because you can't focus on 330 million of them. So they pick this symbol, which you have probably seen before. I know a lot of people think this is Arabic. It's not. It's Sanskrit. This symbol, which is actually three characters from Sanskrit, is the Om, which is a symbol of Brahman. And it's also a symbol of the Atman. Atman means soul. We have a soul, a personal spirit. This symbol recognizes the, the unity between Brahman and our Atman, the Atman of every person. And that's what that symbol is a combination of. Now, in a, uh, we'll talk about Atman in a minute, what our soul and Brahman have to do with each other. The, the three 
primary manifestations of Brahma, the Trimurti, are Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the protector, and Shiva, the destroyer. And these are some of the ways that those are represented. These are the primary, the, the, the trinity of Islam, and the ones you will bump into most often. Vishnu, you'll always recognize because he's blue. Shiva always has the third eye and usually has skulls around his neck because he is the destroyer, all right? But there are 330 million others. In terms of Hindu beliefs, I want to give you some terms because that's the easiest way to talk about what they believe. First is Dharma. This has nothing to do with that 1990s uh, sitcom, Dharma and Greg. Remember Dharma and Greg? I always thought that was a fascinating thing to name your daughter, Dharma. Dharma, actually I had a friend whose family was Christian who named her Karma. We'll get to that in a minute. Dharma is that which supports the universe. In other words, it is the way of rightness or righteousness. It is balance. It is ultimate truth. The goal of every person should be to seek Dharma, meaning balance, ultimate truth, rightness, righteousness. And that is the dominant sort of philosophical concept that Hinduism goes for. We then have Karma. Karma is the accumulation, uh, the accumulated sum of a person's good and bad deeds. Hinduism believes that what you do has consequences. In that regard, they agree with almost, uh, as different as they are from most religions, they agree in that regard. Uh, karma can also mean action, it triggers a cause and effect, and particularly the cause and effect that comes from karma relates to samsara. Samsara is what we call reincarnation, or the transmigration of the soul. The idea that there is a continuing cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth. That when you die, unless you have really achieved the highest level of, of uh, Brahman, then you will come back from the dead as something else. And as an old friend of mine used to say, if you if you live your life and you're really good, then you come back as another person. If you live your life and you're really bad, you come back as a beetle. If you live your life and you're really, really, really good, you don't have to come back at all. That's sort of the principle behind that. In fact, a word I'll look at in a minute, moksha. Moksha is the liberation from samsara. It's the, uh, the, the being released from the responsibility to have to be reborn again. It's sometimes called nirvana. You've heard that expression. Nirvana is more often used in Buddhism. But samsara is the Hindu statement, and that's where that idea came from. And so it literally means one of two things. Moksha, salvation, the freedom from samsara. Either you just are no more, you get absorbed into Brahman, and the ultimate reality, and you don't exist anymore, which is the usual understanding. Or in some cases, Brahman will invite you to come to the highest level of heaven to, take, to serve him for all eternity. But either way, you stop being there. Atman is the true, uh, is the spirit or the true self of every person. And the goal is to try to have your Atman, your true spirit, united with Brahman. That's why the symbol for Brahman includes within that, that character, the symbol for Brahman, for the Om is also the symbol for the Atman, or it's included in it. Avatar, I mentioned, is a deliberate descent of a deity to earth, what most Christians would recognize as an incarnation. A mantra is a sacred utterance, a sound, a syllable, a word, or a group of words that's believed to have power. It's especially a prayer. Those are recorded in the Vedic scriptures, that you learn them, they were pre-written. You don't make it up as you go along, you're reciting something that was written. There is yoga, which is one of the things that's caused the West to accept uh, the principles of Hinduism. Yoga literally is a path or a practice of discipline in which your body, mind, and spirit all are perfected. Yoga. Various paths of yoga are the ways in which you can begin to gain a level of perfection that eventually could lead to you not having to be reborn. That's one of the ways. The other way is through puja. Puja is worship. And worship to a Hindu means uh, purifying through washing, the saying of mantras, the giving of offerings, a of saying of prayers either directly to Brahman or to some of his avatars, the other gods. So through a combination of worship, puja, and through disciplining yourself, yogas, you can become perfected, hopefully to the point that you don't have to be reborn. Bhakti is a devotional practice, especially given to personal gods, because many families will have their own personal god, one of these 330 million that they've selected as their primary one. Uh, divas, I mentioned, are the angelic beings or lesser gods, of which there are 330 million. And ahimsa <coughs> is the Hindu principle of nonviolence. You all know about Hindus and cows, 
right? If you've ever been to India, cows will wander the streets and nobody's allowed to bother them because ahimsa is one of the major disciplines of Hinduism, which is non-violence, which means not killing any animals. The extreme version of that occurs in Jainism. The Jainism, which is an offshoot of Hinduism, it's a separate religion, but began in that, is so concerned about not killing any creatures that a, a, a practicing Jain will wear a, a mask, literally like a surgical mask, in order to keep from inhaling an insect, and they will carry a little broom in order to sweep the sidewalk in front of them so they never step on anything that's alive. They've taken the idea of ahimsa, of not of nonviolence, of not killing anything else, to the extreme. Well, most Hindus are lacto-vegetarians, because if you're not a lacto-vegetarian, or if you're not a vegetarian, you have to kill things. And a major manifestation of ahimsa, nonviolence, is we don't kill things. And the cow, especially, is seen as representative of the mother goddess and of nurture, and so is especially revered in that regard. Okay? But it's an extension of this ahimsa. Now, I mentioned karma, and I mentioned yogas. There are three kinds of karma that you need to understand, and four yogas. And I'm not unrealistic. I know you're going to retain about 3% of this. <laughs> but you will at least have heard it, and so when you hear it again in the future, you'll be able to connect with it. And I, I, told, I warned you, this was complicated. Okay? The most complicated of all the world's religions is Hinduism. So, of the four karmas, karma, remember, is accumulated sum of good and bad things, all the things that you have done, positive and negative, in your life. The three kinds of karma, there is kriyamana, which is current karma. It's what you're doing now, in this life. What's being done now, and you will not know the effects of that until later. So, if you do good now, it's good kriyamana. If you do bad now, if you're mean, it's bad kriyamana. The second kind of karma is sanchita, which is accumulated. It's all of the karma from your past lives. Remember, you've been reincarnated, and you have karma from previous lives. And it has followed you to the present. This stuff piles up on you, good or bad. Okay, so that's sanchita. Then there is prarabdha. Prarabdha is the fruit-bearing um, karma, which means it is the part of the unalterable sanchita. You can't do anything about sanchita. You can't do anything about the stuff that's happened that you've done in previous lives. That's past, but it still affects you. But prahabda is the part of sanchita that causes you to be in the situation you're in now. <laughs> the mess that I'm in is because of uh, prarabda, the part of sanchita, my previous lives. So if you are poverty stricken or sick or whatever, there is a kind of fatalism in Hinduism that says, well, it's because of something you did. This is the manifestation of bad works in the past. If you're wealthy, and actually one of the, one of the four, four aims of Hinduism is wealth, but if you are wealthy and blessed, then that's because the uh, prarabdha, the satchita that followed you from a previous life, is positive. But Either way, you are paying consequences for something that happened in a previous life. And you can't change that. You only deal with it and try to be better for next time around. Okay? Make sense? It may not make complete sense, but at least you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> then, there, how do you get out of all of that? Well, one of the primary ways, other than worship, puja, is through yoga. Yoga are Hindu paths or practices of discipline. Most of you probably, or many of you probably didn't know that yoga is a Hindu concept. But within Hinduism, there is karma yoga, which is an action to do what is right in order to make your karma better. That is actually a discipline. There is uh, nana yoga, which is gaining of knowledge that leads to awareness, which causes you to be better. There is raja yoga, which is meditation in order to cultivate your mind to greater awareness related to nana yoga. And then there is bhakti yoga, love toward God and worship. Bhakti is the word for devotion. So love toward God and worship. Those are the four ways using, those are kinds of yoga that you can use to try to make yourself better in order to have better overall karma and to have a better incarnation next time. Now, most of you, how many of you all have ever taken a yoga class? You did not do any of that. What you did was hatha yoga. Hatha yoga is a secular yoga, which was invented and transported to the West 
which is intended for health and wellness. It involves stretching yourself in unnatural contortions. <laughs> in order to discipline your body and to train your mind, it involves deep breathing and all sorts of things. But that is, that, that's entirely secular. It has nothing to do with the religious idea. If you've gone to a yoga class, that doesn't mean you've become a Hindu, because Hatha yoga is entirely secular, okay? So, you, so that you get that. Now, there are four aims for Purushartha in Hinduism. It's also called the doctrine of the fourfold end of life, or purpose of life. The Krahasta Dharma, or domestic religion, this is for everyday people, has four goals for the pra Prahriti. I, by the way, I don't read Sanskrit, and there's no perfect way, in fact, if you ever read about this stuff, you'll see two or three different ways these things are spelled. Not as bad as in, in Islam, because there's no transliteration uh, directions, you know, from the, uh, for the Quran, for instance, in, in, uh, in writing that in English. But these words are written in different ways. But the prahriti means those in this world, the everyday person, the people who are just living their lives. There are four goals. First, we've already mentioned, is Dharma, which is righteousness, it is right living, doing the right thing. That's one of the goals. The second goal is Artha. Artha means the gaining of wealth and material prosperity. That's one of the goals of life. They do not have a problem with getting rich. In fact, they see that as a sign of you having been blessed because of doing good karma in a previous life, or perhaps even in this life, because karma doesn't always just wait till the next life. There is third, Kama. Remember Kama Sutra? Kama is the gratification of the senses. It's pleasure, it's sensuality, it's sexual and mental enjoyment. This one is very popular in the West. <laughs> the Kama Sutra. There is also Tantric sex. The Tantric disciplines is another part of uh, Hinduism. Sting. You know Sting, the, you know, the musical artist? He is huge on this. He says he can have sex for four hours at a time because he practices Tantric sex. You're going to run out and buy his albums because of that, right? <laughs> and moksha. Moksha, I mentioned already, is the liberation from the rebirth of samsara. That is the supreme goal. And everything else adds up to that. Have you practiced the disciplines of yoga? Have you performed the acts of worship, the puja? Have you had devotion, the bhakti? Have you uh, fulfilled what the Brahman desires for you in your life? If so, the goal ultimately, the final goal, is moksha, release from samsara, not having to be reborn. Now those are all for us ordinary people. If you happen to be one of the monks, one of the ascetics, there's a complete, there, there's really only one focus for them. They're not supposed to be gaining material wealth or satisfying their senses or whatever. They're only focused on moksha. That's for the nivriti. The nivriti are those who have renounced the world, the ascetics, and they have a, only one focus, and that is doing doing the disciplines of, of worship and of yoga in order to be able to re be released from samsara. Now, there are ten disciplines which are considered part of Hinduism. There is the saying of truth, or satya. There is non-violence, or ahimsa, which includes not killing any animals, not eating meat, vegetarians. The extreme of that, again, has evolved, has evolved into Jainism. The Brahmacharya is non-adultery or celibacy. The Asteya means not to steal and not to desire to possess, not to have a craving, you know, this, this is no covet, to use the, the Old Testament term. Then there is Asparagara, which is non-corruption, don't allow yourself to be corrupted. These five are considered the personal virtues of Hinduism, those first five. These are the moral standards you're to live by. In addition to those moral standards, there is Shausha, which is cleanliness, Santosh, which means to seek contentment, there is Swadhyaya, which is reading of the scripture, that is the Vedas, the Upanishads, the, you know, the various scriptures. Um, there is uh, Tapas, which is not a little Japanese bite, or uh, I'm sorry, a uh, Spanish bite. It means austerity, penance, perseverance, to be sorry for your sins and to, to live an austere life. And there is the regular prayers, which is Ishwa Prandaha, to regularly participate in prayers, uh, in prayers, as you remember, are mantras. These are the disciplines that they seek to follow. Now, in addition to these disciplines, there are a lot of rituals in um, the, the Hindu world. Um, there are 
Every morning when an observant Hindu family gets up, they will first bathe. They will then go to a time using either an idol or an icon called a murti. They will have the murti in their house of their favorite diva, their favorite god. And they will uh, say mantras, particular mantras related to their diva or some of the major mantras. They will offer, um, and, and these mantras may be sung. There may be dancing involved. You've seen the Krishnas. Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna, that's very typical of worship in the uh, Hindu faith. Although the Krishna consciousness movement is not considered very pro proper Hinduism by most Hindus, all right? It's considered a cult, even with them. <laughs> so it's a very different kind of thing, but it has brought awareness to some of the principles of Hinduism to the Western world. Uh, that after you have made an offering of food or drink, um, the, often there is a washing of the idol or the murti as well. And then you will finish with, uh, and I should say, I left something out. The first thing that they will do is they will declare a vow before the murti. That's before they do anything else. That after they take a bath, they'll come to the, to the idol, the murti, and they will say a vow. The vow will say who they are, what today is, and why they're coming to this idol. So there won't be any confusion about it. And, what, and, and that's how they start. And then they do the mantras. They will provide an offering of food or drink, and then after the food or drink is offered, by the way, then it will be eaten by the family. They don't leave it there and say, why isn't he eating that? <laughs> um, in fact, the a highest level of devotion or bhakti or uh, puja worship is to go to a Hindu temple and to have a priest do this for you, because priests are considered, purity is a big deal in Hinduism, and that's why there's a lot of washing involved. Um, and there are things that make you impure, much like the Old Testament um, Jewish law. There are a lot of things, bodily fluids, etc., that can cause you to be impure. And so there's a big focus on purity. Well, priests are considered to be purer than regular people. And they know the prayers better, and they can say them better, and the, the, the divas will listen to them better. And so going to a temple and having the priest do this, and the priest gets part of the offering, and sometimes it's paid for it then the priest is considered a better way to worship, having him do it for you, and then afterwards the priest and the family will share. But most observant Hindu families will do this every morning in their house, okay? There are also a, a lot of particular life cycle rites of passage. At almost every point, there are, over, there are 16 primary rites of passion, passion, passage in the Hindu life, and 11 of them have to do with children. There's a big focus on children. Uh, the, before the birth of a child, before the, before the child first kicks in his mother's womb, at the birth of a child, at the circumcision of a child, if they do that, um, the, at the various things, the baby's first feeding of solid food, the baby's first haircut, and on and on, you know, all kinds of rituals. There are also dozens and dozens of festivals. In fact, today, the 28th of August, is the festival of uh, Onam which is a festival in celebration of a mythical king and his victories, all right? So today's a Hindu festival. Almost every day, I think it's a Hindu festival somewhere. Um, but a lot of celebration of festivals, because of the ancient beliefs of use of fire in worship, there are often symbols, fire symbols. For instance, when a, when a Hindu couple gets married, they, are, they will be in front of a fire that's considered a sacred fire. They will turn and walk seven steps away from it, and then turn and walk back toward the fire as a symbol of returning, you know, perhaps wandering away, but then returning to the fire which represents the ultimate reality, and then they will feed the fire as a symbol of their commitment to Brown. Something that a lot of people are aware of are the social classes called varnas in uh, Hinduism. The Hindu Shastras, remember Shastras is the, is the generic word for all of the Hindu religious writings, especially the Bhagavad Gita, identify all people as, as residing in one of four classes, or Varnas. Those are the Brahmins, which are the Vedic teachers, Vedic meaning the teachers of the Vedas, Vedic teachers and priests. Secondly, the Kshatriyas, who are the warriors and the kings. The third level is the Vaishas, or the farmers and merchants. And the fourth level are the Shudras, who are the servants and laborers. Now, within that four broad categories, there are many, many, many further castes. It's broken down. In the, in the lowest level of the Shudras are often called the untouchables. All right? They are considered the outcasts of society, the lepers of most of society. Now, there have been, there's a lot of controversy. Scholars debate whether this caste system was actually intended in Hindu scripture or whether 
the Hindu scripture give these four broad categories, which are simply labels. They don't necessarily indicate uh, inherent limitations, but it just recognizes these different places. And the Bhagavad Gita says, whatever place you are in life, you should be, you know, do your best with that. You have responsibilities, so live up to them. Um, this turned into, probably because of social pressure, this idea that people are suppressed, that they're held down if they belong to the wrong, uh, wrong varna or especially to the wrong caste. And the British Empire, when they controlled India, had to work very, very hard to try to get rid of some of that. Although now, some Indian scholars claim that the British were as responsible for that as anything else. Right? A lot of modern thinking in uh, Indian and Hindu, and that is subcontinent of India, not Native Americans, or as my friend of mine used to say, dots, not feathers. Um, the, the subcontinent of India has been kind of a rethinking and rewriting of some of the earlier history. And they much of it has been in colonial Western influence that has even dictated what the history was, and they're beginning to recover some of that. These Varnas still are considered very important because, again, they are seen as reflecting your karma. Where you are in life, whether you are, you know, a king, warrior, merchant, or whether you're a servant, is dependent upon how you lived in your previous life. And that's not something ultimately you can change, although. Indians would say, Hindus would say that you can grow or, or advance within your particular varna or caste. There's a question as to how far you can go with that though. In fact, this is so much a part of the culture that someone who has renounced the world, who has renounced you know, a monk, an ascetic, is called a varnatita, which means he is beyond all varnas. He doesn't fit in anymore with all the usual expectations of society. This uh, picture is the um, Swami Narayan Asharakam, this stuff is very hard to pronounce, temple which is in Delhi. It's one of the largest, it is the largest of Hindu temples. The Hindu temple is considered a house for the gods, quite literally. I mean, we talk about churches being the house of the Lord, but we don't actually think he lives here. In fact, our scriptures are very clear, Jewish and, and Christian scriptures, that God doesn't live here. The Hindus think he does, or they do. Brahma does and his, his various avatars do. There is within that a space where the various uh, murtis or idols will be placed. There is a design of an area where you can either come face to face with these various murtis and various temples will have certain ones they emphasize more than others because they can't have all 330 million of them. And there often will be either you can go face to face or they will be created with like a, um, a walkway around because if you can't come face to face with the ultimate reality you can at least walk around it. And so there is this idea, this is where um, often there are artistic festivals, annual festivals of religious rites of passage, community celebrations, it really is a community center. In modern times there have been a number of different movements, I've mentioned yoga is bringing some of the, is the Hindu ideas to the West. There has also been um, Kama Sutra and the Tantric Sex Movement, Transcendental Meditation is considered a variant off of Hinduism. Um, Ayurvedic health. Um, you, you all buy any of you all buy Ayurveda uh, beauty products? Ayurveda is a, is a Hindu word. It literally means a system of gaining health, physical health. So Ayurveda divination, so palmistry, numerology, astrology, some of that is, has been Hindu. Various people like the Sri Chinmoy, um, the and a lot of others, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. A lot of those, become, Hindus wouldn't say they're not Hindus, but they would sort of scratch their head and go, boy, that's a weird kind of Hinduism. <laughs> but it's because Hinduism will accept many different kinds of beliefs. All right, I have just spent an hour telling you about the most complicated religion on the planet, and I know it's complex. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yes? Okay, their God lives there. Where does the Christian God live? Well, they... Interestingly enough, Hinduism is not, does not usually, with the exception of the 1990s and 2000-ish, uh, when the gov very conservative nationalistic government took over and started encouraging the persecution of Christians, Hinduism generally would say all of these are manifestations of Brahman, the ultimate reality, and they would include Jesus in that. They would include the God of the Old Testament in that. But they would say Brahman is bigger than that, and he's not limited to that. That Jesus was not the Son of God, as Christians would say, but rather was simply an avatar and a manifestation. And so when you go into a temple, they will recognize that as a place of devotion, bhakti, or puja, worship, for any of the manifestations. 
but they will stick with the Hindu, usually the Murti, the idols or icons, will be of the, uh, the gods of Hinduism, which primarily, again, are represented in Vishnu, Brahma, and Brahma's actually the creator is not emphasized as much, or Shiva, or Devi, Shakti, um, those are the ones that are favorites because they represent things people really like, and so they, they will emphasize those. They would not say that the Christian God or the Jewish God is not real, but they would say it's only one among many. And, that is it. and that's why Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity, Islam have fundamentally different ideas about the nature of God. Well, where does the Christian God live? Uh, according to them? No. Oh. The Christian God is a spirit, and he is not resident in any one place. He is higher than the heavens, according to Scripture. So there is no one place where he lives. He is present in all places. Okay? We'll get into that when we talk about Judaism and Christianity, because that's true with both Judaism and Christianity. Other questions about Hinduism? Every time I say other questions, people <laughs> laugh. Yes? It seems very much work for people to follow this right. compared to Christianity. I say that out. Wow, Christianity is easy. <laughs> right. Yeah, she says it seems like a lot of work compared to Christianity. Um, some religions are more about orthodoxy, which means right belief. Christianity is one of those, about believing rightly. Some religions, including Hinduism, the oldest religions, are more about orthopraxy, which means right action. Orthodoxy, right belief. Orthopraxy, right action. In fact, Hinduism would say, orthodoxy doesn't really matter. You can believe almost anything you want if you do the right worship toward Brahman and whatever, whatever version of him you like, whatever path toward him you found, and if you uh, seek to perfect yourself so that you can, through yogas and through worship, so that you ultimately can achieve moksha, which is release from reincarnation, from transmigration of the soul, from samsara. Okay, so, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, and it's very hard, and there's always a sense in which, have I done enough, or am I going to come back as, you know, as a toad? Um, I hope not, but there's no guarantee until you get there. Yes? Um, since they're working toward perfection, is there anyone that they are people that they recognize as being the last life? No, has, is there anyone that the Hindus believe have, have reached the, the last of their lives that is in perfection? No, um, because if they really had reached perfection, they wouldn't be here. They'd be gone. They'd either be in nirvana, to use the Buddhist term, because we hear that word, which means nothingness, literally. They would, they would have been absorbed into the Brahman and not exist as, as an individual uh, Atman, an individual soul anymore. Their soul would have been merged with the Brahman or else they would have been taken into the highest level. They, they have a view of six levels of celestial levels. The top one is where, the penthouse is where Brahman lives. And he can take souls there to serve him. The next six levels of the celestial realm, sort of dimensions, are where the 330 million divas live. And then there are sort of, sort of seven middle levels, which are the kind of the earthly levels or dimensions. They are protected by demons, called nagas, um, you all know Harry Potter, you know, the, the serpent that is the, like the bad guy, remember he's called Nagata? Naga is a demon in Hinduism. And the demons protect the treasures that are available in that world. And then there are 28 levels of hell, or the lower regions, where people go for a time until they get reincarnated. And, you know, they're punished in that time and then they get reincarnated. But if somebody has really reached that level, now they believe that there are swamis, or teachers, there are various kinds of, they don't use the word guru, but we, we know the word guru. The guru is actually a, a much more of a, a uh, oh, we'll get into that. It's a different, different thing, okay? Um, the, the swamis, the teachers, the monks, the ascetics, they believe they have reached a higher level in this life and therefore have different goals. But if they're here, then that means they're not done yet. And they still have to work at it. Or else they wouldn't be here. Yes? My question concerns language. Exactly. Are most ceremonies that are carried out, I would say, in one of these uh, temples, is it all in Hindi, or are they different languages in different sections of India? You're exactly right. There are hundreds of languages in India. Hindi is the most common. Um, and Sanskrit is the language of the, um, of the religion of Hinduism. That's what the, the writings are in. 
An example would be Hebrew was a dead language. No one spoke Hebrew. But the Hebrew scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, uh, what we call the Old Testament, was still written, it was written in Hebrew, and it was still read in Hebrew. So anyone who was, an, who was a follower of that religion prior to the late 1940s when Israel was established as a nation and they began to do the impossible, the linguist said, it's not possible to revive a dead language, but they did. Hebrew came back from the dead. There are some people who are advocating trying to do that with Sanskrit. There are just over 14,000 people in India who still claim Sanskrit as their first language, but only 14,000 of the population of India is a few more than that. Um, and so, but Sanskrit still as the holy language is one that people who are serious about their following of Hinduism will learn enough Sanskrit, just like someone who is Jewish would learn Hebrew, be taught Hebrew, in order to be able to read the Hebrew scriptures, even if that's not the language they speak every day. There are some Hindu uh, activities that will, you know, like family rituals and etc., involving children and whatnot, that they will use a more local language in. And I, uh, my understanding is that's acceptable. But Sanskrit is still the religious language, and that's what all, all of the holy writings is are done. Now, like most holy writings, it can be translated into other languages, and often is, but still Sanskrit is the language. Not, that's not as big a deal as in, in, in Islam. In Islam, the Quran is written in Arabic. Arabic is considered to be the language of God, that Allah speaks Arabic, that it is the holy language. And so therefore, you cannot legitimately translate the Quran from Arabic to any other language. If you read the Quran in English or any other language, it's not considered the Quran, it's considered a commentary. Other, other religions don't have as big a hang-up with that, but still Sanskrit is the basic language of the, of the Hindu faith. Any last, one, one more, if anybody's got one more question. Yes? Exactly. I'm, I'm puzzling because I should know the answer to that. I know, I think there's an inclination toward much greater equality because the goddesses of Islam, or the goddesses of Hinduism, uh, are often held up. Now the main, like the, the Trimurti, the main trinity, are all male, but they all have consorts. And Shakti, or Devi, is a female. Um, and they are held in the highest regard and are considered, you know, Lakshmi, which is the Hindi word for the, the Sanskrit word for luck, uh, Lakshmi is considered a very favorite. You know, she's very loving and gentle, etc. And because of the fact that they hold up the goddesses, um, I should know the answer to that. I don't. My sense is that they probably have greater quality than a lot of other religions, but I don't know that. I, I, and a lot of it comes into social things. Often religion will sort of set the standard of that how they, that, like I say, the caste system. A lot of scholars will say the caste system is not in. The, the writings is not, are not in the Shastras. The, the, the Varnas are the big categories, but how, you know, the fact that you use it to suppress people is not, or, or oppress people is not in it. Thank you all very much. Come back next week.